So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's resume our uh, uh, session from last week on NCLT rules uh, 2016. We had already completed part one, where we talked about the various definitions and also understood uh, key points uh, to understand the rules better. So let's take that forward. Over to Anil sir. Thank you, Ankit. So we. <clears throat> We have done part one and uh, see, first of all, thanks for joining all the participants. Uh, so the part two is a continuation of uh, our deliberations on NCLT rules 2016. As I have already said that the NCLT rules are important for insolvency and bankruptcy practice because NCLT is the adjudicating authority for IBC. So therefore, the adjudicating authority will function according to NCLT rules because their structure, their powers, their uh, procedure that comes from NCLT rules. So therefore, it is very important that like all applications or IAs, uh, every uh, every function of NCLT is governed by NCLT rules. So we left our last session on inherent powers, which is rule 11. And in case we see the rule 11, uh, it's very small. And however, it is it actually gives very big powers to uh, NCLT benches. Now the rule 11 says nothing in these rules shall be deemed to limit or otherwise affect the inherent powers of the tribunal to make such orders as may be necessary for, as may be necessary for meeting the ends of the justice or to prevent abuse of the process of the tribunal. Now, meeting the ends of the justice, normally like when it is supposed to be used, when the bench thinks that there is a justice in a decision and then there is no provision for that particular justice uh, to be delivered, then they can use a, a rule 11. So initially, uh, you may recall that the many uh, judgments, when many CIRP orders were withdrawn under rule 11, uh, only to meet the end of justice and to prevent abuse of the process of the tribunal. That was the kind of uh, uh, initial trend. And then, then thereafter, later on, section 10, 12A was inserted. So still going back, uh, Gauri Prashad Goenka versus Surinder Kumar Agarwal is one judgment on Rule 11. This was January 20. Now in this judgment, first of all, Section 9 petition was admitted and the matter was immediately settled with the operational creditor much prior to the constitution of COC and more than the amount claimed has been paid by two demand drafts and is over to the advocate of the operational creditor on, on a particular date. Now, operational creditor also moved an application for withdrawal under Rule 11 of uh, uh, NCLT Rule 29-16 on the same day on 9th of January 2020, but no order was passed and it was adjourned for 3rd March 2020. Meanwhile, uh, AA directed the IRP to constitute the COC within a week. Now, <clears throat> the NCLAT observations you know, and clear observations are uh, and clear observations are that the uh, and clear set aside the order and held that the double a uh, without disposing of the application filed under rule 11 of the nclt rules uh, has no jurisdiction to defer the matter and direct the irb to constitute the coc to render application filed under rule 11 as infractuous so one, the section 11 application is pending, uh, sorry, rule 11 application is pending. Uh, two, that the NCLT is directing the IRP to proceed further and constitute the COC. So this is something which is uh, not justified. So therefore, if the A of the view that the application under section 11 is fit to be rejected and uh, only after rejecting the same, it could have directed the IRP to constitute the COC. This is therefore it's a fit case to entertain application under rule 11 of NCLT and to allow the same. 
so this was one uh, judgment where even after the constitution of the uh, coc rule 11 was invoked and the cirp was quashed now the second uh, judgment that we would like to show is the be billy moria and company limited versus mick vikram is part uh, of again and clear judgment in the february 20 it was delivered whether at the time of uh, the question of law in this judgment was whether at the time of settlement adjudicating authority exercising the powers under rule 11 of nclt rules may direct the appellant to pay interest for the period of delay in payment period of delay in payment that's the power which is being discussed as whether the rule 11 has this power or not now in this case uh, the respondent means the corporate data supplying steel to the appellant and this is worth 2.16 crore and payment also has been made as 1.16 crore and then outstanding is only 98 lakhs so after issuing the demand notice the application was filed and the uh, on, on the next date january 2019 both the parties informed a about the settlement and payment schedule has been accepted by the and the payment schedule has been accepted by the respondent at that time a question was raised by the respondent that the appellant had not made any provision for the payment of interest for the period of delay then both the parties agreed that whatever rate of interest decided by the double a shall be agreeable to them it is also informed that there is a clause in the payment of interest in the case of delay now this adjudicating authority after taking into consideration the facts of the case directed the applicant to pay interest at the rate of 12 percent for the period of delay in payment so 12 percent was uh, directed by the adjudicating authority now the observation of NCLAT says when the party have amicably settled their dispute and both the parties are agreeable to come and communicate the double to decide the rate of interest it was also informed that there was a clause of payment of interest of 24% interest in case of delay. Hence, the adjudicating authority exercising the power under Rule 11 of NCLT 2016, uh, which empowers the tribunal to make such orders as may be necessary for meeting the ends of justice or to prevent abuse of the process of the decision, directed the applicant to pay 12% only for the period of in, in delay in the payment. Thus, the order is justified and agreeable. So that means the adjudicating authority has a right to award interest for the delayed payment. And this is also in view of the uh, documentation where it was mentioned, 24%. And the documentation was accepted by the adjudicating authority to the extent of 12% because in the document, the rate of interest was written as 24%. However, 12% was awarded by NCLT. So that is NCLT say that they have power to do so. Similarly, Syntex Plastic Technology Limited versus Jalem Industries Private Limited. Again, July 21 judgment from NCLT and the bar. So first two judgments were from NCLAT. And this judgment is from Ahmedabad NCLT. Now, whether there is a, the question of law, whether there is a ground to allow application for withdrawal of CIERP filed under Rule 11 of NCLT rules, read right with Section 60, Subsection uh, 5 of the IBC. So, let's see what the finally NCLT says. Now, the financial lenders eventually constitute COC, hence during the during period where there is a stay on constitution of COC, instructions can be taken from uh, the lenders, as in uh, some cases of constitution of committee, it is its approval may be required in relevant reasons of the IBC. Uh, I think the constitution of COC was approved and it was said that the constitution may be done. It is to be noted that the in present case, IRP is discharging its function only to carry on corporate data as a going concern and no other party such as employee or operational creditor or lenders have shown any grievance, have shown any grievance against the conduct of the IRP. Thus, for these reasons, the plea of the corporate data is rejected. Thus, considering all legal aspects and applying same 
to facts and circumstances of the case. This court is of the view that interest of all stakeholders will remain intact if this application is allowed. Will remain intact if this application is allowed. According to the application filed under Rule 11 of NCLT uh, rules, stands allowed and disposed of in terms of indicate in terms indicated above. So, committee has been constituted, and the IRP, in fact, constituted the COC. IRP was continuing with his functions, and IRP did not get deterred by uh, this. Uh, did not get deterred by this application under section under rule 11 because the irp is supposed to do his job unless there is an order uh, for staying the process now in in this case uh, uh, another observations by nclt is the corporate debtor is directed to pay fee and all expenses incurred by IR, irp since commencement of day commence for a CIRP till date. Uh, IRP is also directed to hand over all records and documents of the corporate debtor to management of the corporate debtor forthwith. So whatever time the IRP has functioned, uh, the, it was directed to the CD uh, that they should pay all the expenses of the IRP and all the uh, fee of the IRP. And the IRP was also, IRP was also directed to hand over all the records. Now, going to Rule 14, the tribunal may, on sufficient cause being shown, exempt the parties from compliance and may give such directions as it may consider as it may consider just and expedient on the application moved in this behalf to render substantial justice. Uh, this is the Rule 14, the may on sufficient ground being shown, exempt the parties from compliance and may give such directions as it may consider just and expedient on the application move. So this is also one important part is any exemption that we need to file, if ask from the adjudicating authority, exemptions from any kind of compliance, they are, it is, it is required that the application be moved uh, in this behalf to render the substantial justice. So without application, the power to exempt, uh, I believe, doesn't exist. Then is the power to extend time under Rule 15. The all the timelines, whatever timelines is given by the tribunal, uh, under the our adjudicating authority, under the law, under regulations, or in the last orders, that can be extended by the uh, tribunal. The the only thing is. Upon such terms, in any case, uh, the justice of the case may require any enlargement may be ordered, although the application thereof is not made unless until after the expiration of the time appointed or allowed. So, Ankit, I think uh, you can see in case you can add something because these are general uh, law where the extension of time is allowed, extension of time. Although people try to use it in a different manner, the in in this case the people try to use it in different manner. But then you can see in case you can add something, and we are talking about the power to extend time, power to exempt, or observations of the NCLT. And these are all uh, the judgments that we have discussed. So I think uh, these are all like uh, uh, rules and like uh, conceptually we understand these powers and uh, these are all part of the NCLT's functioning today. Uh, I, I don't think there is any observation per se. So let's understand what maybe the other rules are saying. Uh, so rule 15, thing. rule 15, yeah. as we talk, powers to extend time. In fact, there is a judgment on rule 15, which is Glix Securities Private Limited versus RD Rubber Reclaim Limited and the RP in this case was Ms. Mamta Binani. So this is June 21 case, in this case. So in this particular case, the, uh, the, the rule 15, it was tried to be used. It was tried to be used by, so whether NCLT by invoking rule 15 of the NCLT rules can extend timelines for implementation of the resolution plan. Now the implementation of the resolution plan is totally governed by the resolution plan. It is not governed by any of the provisions in the law, maybe regulation or maybe even 
the uh, code. So there is no uh, nothing which actually talks about the uh, extending the timelines for implementation of the resolution plan. Let's see what it says. The background of the case is the application was filed by the successful resolution praying for extension of timeline for implementation of the resolution plan in view of second wave of COVID-19 pandemic, whereby the multiple business and financial entities having suffered tremendously. So again, it, it is saying that it is a force major circumstances necessitating intervention in the better interest of the corporate debtor. So this, it was considered to be a force, a force major. Now the observations of the NCLT in this case was that the in fact in in fact of the present case the resolution plan was submitted at time there was significant increase in the COVID. There is no specific provision in IBC that specify that what should be done in cases where a successful resolution applicant applies to the court for extension of timeline either on account of force major circumstances or otherwise. Further. Once a resolution plan has been approved by the AA, the COC ceases to exist. Now, therefore, there is no way that the adjudicating authority can direct. There is no way that the adjudicating authority can direct COC to consider the request. And however, it is up to the adjudicating authority to find a way out in such circumstances by invoking Rule 15 of the NCLT. In present case, the application for extension was allowed by invoking rule 15 of the NCLT as the application for extension was made only due to COVID-19 pandemic. Further, the extension in timeline of resolution plan shall have effect only if applicant submits an undertaking affidavit in registry, for failing which the consequence of violation of the approved resolution plan shall swiftly be followed. So this is something the probably what I uh, think that the uh, this extension was allowed on, by invoking Rule 15, and because it was a requirement of the timeline, it was required because of the resolution plan getting struck up. So I believe this is uh, this is okay that Rule 15 was used for extension of the timeline also. Now we go forward to powers and functions of president and registrar. Powers and functions of president and registrar, and. Now the functions of the president. Functions of the president, it's basically simple. I mean, there is no point going through uh, in detail, preside over the consideration, direct the registry, prepare an annual report, transfer any case from one bench to the other bench, to withdraw the work or case from the court or member, perform general superintendence and control over the administration function. And let's see the powers of the registrar. Registrar of a particular bench, the powers are a registrar shall have the following function, namely registration of the appeal, petition, and application, receive applications for amendment of appeal or the petition uh, or application or subsequent proceedings, receive applications for fresh summons or notices and regarding services thereof, receive applications for substituted service of the summons and notices, receive applications for seeking orders concerning the administration and inspection of the documents, transmission of a direction or order to the civil court as directed by the tribunal with the prescribed certificate for execution and such other incidental or matters as the president may, may uh, direct from time to time. So this is all uh, in case we have to consolidate. It is basically receiving applications, petitions, uh, subsequent proceedings, fresh summons, notices, and substitute service and admission, inspection of documents, all these are the powers of the registrar. Now, Ankit, we move on to institution of proceedings, petitions, and appeals. Uh, like this particular part deals with the procedure. This particular part deals with the procedure. So this is slightly important. The, in fact, every appeal, petition, application, caveat, objection, presented in English. This is what rule says. And if there is any other language, if there is any other document, then it should be accompanied by a copy translated in English. So if the original document in a different language, then that has to be translated in English before we submit to the NCLT. 
fairly and legibly typewritten, lithographed, printed in double spacing on one side. So this is something which is very important. All the documents, whatever we submit to NCLT, it should be printed in double spacing on one side of the standard partition. You can't use the front and the back both sides of paper. It should be one side of the standard paper, standard paper partition. And there is a margins also. In fact, there are margins also, which has been provided. Margins are also provided in the uh, NCLT rules. It says that four centimeter width in the top and with the right margin of 2.5 and the left margin of five. Now, when we see this right margin of 2.5 and left margin of five, when I see the legal paper, the legal paper size is 22 cm, 22 centimeter. Out of, out of the 22 centimeter, seven and a half goes into the uh, margins. So therefore, what is left? What is left is the, uh, it's only about 13 and a half is left. So that actually becomes something which is written in the center. So according to our experience, as far as the left margin is concerned, the purpose of the left margin is that the most of the benches would need it as a, a kind of stitched together. Stitched, so when the stitch, stitching is done, I understand that almost two centimeter space is consumed and therefore the left margin is five centimeters. And the right margin is 2.5 centimeter. And again, I think the reason is that the, Sometimes the paper can actually be, paper can tear up from the right side. So therefore, the right margin is, is that way. So all the documents should be paginated, indexed, and stitched together. Paginated, indexed, stitched together. Now the procedures. Now the procedures, the first, first of all, the cause title shall state. Cause title shall state. Okay, whenever do we, we uh, start writing, Whenever we start writing a petition or an application or an appeal, the first thing it should be mentioned in the top before the national companies are tribal. And this is the, this is not a practice. This is not a tradition. This is something which is provided in the rules that in case of an application, it has to start like this. And the, the way it starts, and it is uh, every every advocate will start like this only. The cause title shall set out proceedings or the order of the authority against which it is preferred. Set out the proceedings, like if it is an interlocutory application, then it would first say the main proceedings and the authority against which it is preferred. Authority means even the section under which it is preferred. Now, appeal or petition, the application counter objection shall be divided into paragraphs. All appeals should be divided into paragraphs and the paragraphs should be numbered consecutively. And wherever the SACA dates are used and corresponding uh, uh, Gregorian calendar also dates should be used. So the whenever we talk about any person, party, full name, parentage, age, description of each party and address that must be mentioned uh, in, the, in the memo of parties. So, and it is also in, in the beginning of the set out in the beginning of the appeal or petition or application and need not be repeated. So in case of a representative, in case of a representative character, like if somebody is represented, representing an, a, 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 like a group of home buyers or group of workers. So it should be mentioned first and then later on it is not required to be repeated. And the name of the party shall be numbered collectively. Now there are parties uh, the, when we say memo of party or when we say respondents, it can be number one, two, three, four, five. Because see, the, most of the petitions would be made by referring to the party number one, party number four, party number six, or respondent number five, respondent number three. So these numbering cannot be changed. So in case any party is deleted later on, that number would be deleted. However, uh, the number of other parties would not change. Similarly, in case of any situation where the one party gets divided into three because of any death and the legal heirs may join. So the if the that party uh, number was three, then all the legal heirs will have 3.1, 3.2, 3.3. That is the reason because the other parties will not change. The numbers of the other parties will not change because most of the uh, pleadings 
appeals application that has already been made according to those numbering. So the legal here, as I already said, so the, if any fresh party has to be added, it will be numbered consecutively after the first parties. You cannot insert a party in between because if a new party has added, even if the new party is very important, then the numbering should be consecutively and the existing party numbers will not be changed. And the then uh, under the law title, everything has to be mm, everything has to be provided like under which law this application is made. Now, in this, uh, we have experience, our legal people, they have an experience though they have also noted their own experiences, like only the uh, NCLT benches at Chandigarh, Delhi and Allahabad, uh, they somehow use the uh, green paper, otherwise all other parties, they use the uh, white paper, uh, having the legal size, and the legal size is 22 centimeter by 35 centimeter. That's what I could attend. Now the, as I said that white legal paper size, as I said, the documents like Chandigarh, Delhi and Allahabad, in fact, they use the white legal size paper and documents. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the other than these three benches, all others are using the green legal size paper and the benches at Ahmedabad and Indore, they are asking for spiral binding and the benches at Kolkata, they require a special triple punch binding, special triple punch binding they require. So I have seen even there are people, specialized people, like there are advocates, they go to the office of the NCLT and they will find some people are doing this work and they will do this triple punch binding and they will submit. But in case any uh, bunch of paper is more than 200 pages, then a fresh volume has to be prepared. In case there are pages which are 600, then three volumes will be made, volume one, volume two, volume three. And there will be an index and the index will be attached to each volume. Index will be attached to each volume. See, when we talk about the address and it is the requirement as per the uh, NCLT rules that whenever we uh, talk about address for service of any someone or for service of any notice. So this is the way this address is expected to be. The name of the road, street, lane, municipal division or ward, municipal door, name of the town or village, the post office, postal district and pin code, and the other particulars like which is important to locate, identify the address such as fax number, mobile number, with the valid email ID, etc. This is required for the, the this is required for uh, proper uh, issue, the issuing of summary, summons or the notices. Now coming, Ankit, any, any questions now at this moment? So so no questions per se, but I think so just one observation that like recently I we, we got the notification that the Supreme Court has won and the high courts have also now started talking about using A4 paper. Uh, the A lot of regulations which were prepared earlier were based on the idea that the quality of printers was not allowing, uh, you know, that was a restraint. So I think today... Uh, one, the also like double-sided printing is something that there shouldn't be any reason to not allow that wherever a physical printout is going. That certainly has an environmental impact. Secondly, I believe uh, uh, the uh, idea of uh, uh, A4 paper, uh, like that should be encouraged. Uh, then, of course, we have different standards for different NCLT and that most probably should be all uh, merged into one. Uh, I think most high courts and Supreme Court have also adopted these uh, this, these formats and this just makes it more comfortable for anyone to do this work. Yeah. Uh, like in many of our cases where we are, say, auditors, we would ask the client to print a document and sign it and send it to us. Uh, maybe that would not be possible in case, you know, you have to print on a legal size paper or a green paper, then you will have to do that and then send it physically, then sign it and then get it back. So it brings a, brings a lot of efficiency there. 
I think you are right. One that there should be uniform practice across the benches. Two, the use of A4 paper should be encouraged. Three, double size printing should also be encouraged. Uh, I think the advantages that you have already enumerated, one advantage is that this A4 paper is available with everyone. It actually increases the efficiency and the load on different, different practitioners or litigants that would be reduced. So if there is a question, we can take up the questions. No question so far. Then the, then the recent rules that were prescribed by High Court, I think they also prescribed the minimum GSM because a lot of times you have very, very uh, thin paper which tears off or which is very delicate. So all that is also something that is taken care of now in those regulations, I think, which is absent here. You yeah, can have a is. legal paper, but it can be a very thin paper which may, not, uh, which may be uncomfortable for the judges to read. And also may not survive longer. So if there is any correction, any eraser interlineations, then that has to be initialed by the parties. That is also a part of the rules, although we generally take it. Now, the uh, see, like again, we will see the uh, how the petitions would be made, how it would be uh, like uh, how it would be bound margins, paper, everything that we have seen. Now we go to rule 23, where the presentation of the petition. So first of all, all these documents, appeals, everything is to be presented in triplicate. And in triplicate, when we say, and then we say that it is uh, to be submitted in triplicate. And in case there are a number of parties, number of respondents are, in case the number of respondents are more, then we'll have to add one copy for each respondent. Because the, the, the basic requirement is that the uh, it is required to be it is required to be uh, forwarded, it required to be sent by the registrar to other parties as a notice. So then the, then the question is, uh, what is the 35 documents? Because see, every petition, every appeal has to be accompanied by documents duly certified. You know, the documents duly certified that we have already, it, we saw it in the definitions in the part one of NCLT rules that we deliberated, that what is the meaning of the certified? And one is the document, one is the document was certified, then the other is the certified true copy. So they both had meaning, certified is one meaning and certified true copy is another meaning. So the amount, it's like in, in this, um, when we submit the documents, we also are supposed to submit some fee uh, and that fee would be used for service on the opposite party. And that would depend upon the number of volumes and number of papers. And that fee has to be paid uh, documents and everything can be served on the opposite party. Serving copy uh, thereof in advance on the opposite side is also, a, it's also provided with the required number of envelopes and of sufficient size and notice from shall, shall be filed along with the number of fee. So the requirement is that in case there are uh, six notices to be issued to six parties, then it is the duty of the litigant applicant to submit the copies of the documents which are required to be, which are required to be uh, serviced on any other party, then for those kind of service, uh, some efforts is required from NCLT also. So there is a processing charge, processing fee, which is payable to NCLT for all these, uh, for all these kind of uh, uh, servicing. Number of copies to be filed is again, three authenticated, co authenticated copies and one plus, plus, deliver one copy of each to, uh, to the opposite parties, one copy to each of the opposite party. So here there are judgments in on rule 20, rule 24 and 26, and that is Centillion Solutions and Services Private Limited versus Foria Technologies in India, India Lim, uh, Private Limited, March 21 is the date, and it is also from the Ahmedabad bench. Now the operational creditor in this case, uh, Ankit, would you be able to uh, take up this uh, few part of it? 
Yeah, why not? So, yes, prison yeah. creators uh, uh, file an application. Okay. So, observation by NCLT here is so operation creator filled file an application under section 9 of IBC was uh, filed for initiating CRP against Euphoria Technologies Lim Private Limited. CD filed the reply to present application and contended that the present application is not accompanied by the no dispute affidavit as, envis as envisaged under section 9.3 B of IBC. Therefore, the present application is liable to be rejected on this ground. The corporate debtor further contended that the application filled by the uh, filed by the operational creditor is not supported by an affidavit as prescribed under rules uh, 10 of uh, AA rules, read with rule 22, 24, and 26. Uh, operational creditor submitted uh, procedure followed by tribunal is crystal clear and present petition was listed after curing the objections raised by the registry. But these were the observations that people can see. So the observations the were the contention of the corporate debtor in the respect that the present application is not supported with an affidavit as prescribed under rule 10 of AA rules and rule 20 to 24 and 26 of NCLT rules is 2016 is not valid. On perusal of the affidavit in support of the instant application, it means that the contents of the said affidavits are clear and consist of contents required for verifying the present application. No format as such has been prescribed by aforesaid rules for verification of uh, for verification affidavit. More so said affidavit does not affect the merit of the present application. So the affidavit part was uh, uh, was basically handled in this way by NCLT. So they said that there is no format which needs to be taken care of. I so think the next the, yes yeah. yes please go ahead. So this one is on lodging of caveat. Caveat is, of course, the, any person may lodge a caveat in triplicate in any appeal or petition or application that may be instituted before this tribunal by paying the prescribed fee after forwarding a copy by a registered post or serving the same on the expected petitioner or appellant and the caveat shall be in the form prescribed and contain such Details and particulars or orders or directions, details of authority against whose orders or directions the appeal or petition or application is being instituted by the expected appellant. Uh, so, caveat is filed wherever there is an expectation that the other party will do a litigation. So, the idea of filing a caveat is that you ask the court not to pass any order without hearing the other party. So, somebody can just go quietly. Uh, get an order, get a stay from the court uh, uh, against an order or against uh, uh, in an appeal matter. So there a caveat is filed that in case somebody files this case against us, please let us know. And that's the information yeah, that you tell the court or inform but the nine, court. 90 days is also very important. Okay? So the caveat shall remain valid for a period of 90 days from the date of its filing. So it, after 90 days, either you'll have to file a fresh caveat in case you still feel that an order a caveat, uh, an application can be submitted, but otherwise, yes, that's the time limit. This one is for endorsement and verification. So, at the foot of every petition or appeal or pleading, there shall appear the name and signature of the authorized representative. Every petition or appeal shall be signed and verified by party concerned in the manner provided by these rules. So, Mm, translation of a document, so any document which is other than English uh, intended to be used in proceedings before tribunal shall be received by registry accompanied by a copy in English which is agreed to by the parties or certified to be a true translated copy by the AR engaged on behalf of parties in case or by any other advocate or authorized representative whether engaged in case or not, if the, if the advocate or authorized representative engaged in the case, authenticates that certificate or prepared by a translator approved by the purpose by the registrar on payment of such charges as may be, as he may order. So appeal or petition or other proceeding uh, shall not be set down for hearing until and unless all parties confirm that all the documents filed on which they intend to rely are in English or have been translated into English and required number of copies are filed into tribunal. So English is the, of course, the language of the court right. has to be all documents have to be translated in case they're not in English language. 
person in charge of the filing. I think this is uh, this is regarding the uh, rule twenty eight, which is regarding endorsement and scrutiny of petitions or appeal. So whenever any uh, document appeal is filed, it goes for scrutiny of a petition or appeal. And then the filing counter starts with scrutiny, and in some cases, the scrutiny also goes to the registrar level. But then this is uh, this is something which is important that whenever we file, yes, Ankit, you can continue. This is the 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 person who is receiving registry. They affix a sign a day uh, the affix the date uh, stamp of the tribunal. Yes, please. Ankit. So, person in charge of the filing counter, the registry shall immediately on receipt of petition or appeal or application or document affix the date stamp of tribunal thereon and also an additional copies of the index and return the acknowledgement to the party and shall have and shall also affix his initials on the stamp affixed on the first page of the copies mm -hmm. and enter the particulars of all such documents in the register after daily filing. And assign a diary number which shall be entered below the date stamp and there, thereafter cause it to be sent for scrutiny. So if on scrutiny the appeal or petition or application or document is found to be defective, such document shall after notice to the party be returned for compliance. And if such a failure to comply within seven days from the date of return, the same shall be placed before the registrar who may pass appropriate orders. So this is how you good, good. do this. Mm. I think this then continues now. The registrar may, for sufficient cause, return the said document for verific for rectification or amendment to the party filing the case, and for this purpose may allow to the party concerned such reasonable time as may be con as it as he may consider necessary or extend the time of compliance. Where the party fails to make any step for the removal of defect within the time fixed for the same, the registrar may, for reasons to be recorded in writing, decline to register the pleading or document. So, in case we don't remove the defects, then the registrar even can the registrar can even say that the they can decline the regist, uh, receiving documents. Yes. So, I will take up this rule twenty nine registration of proceedings admitted, like on admission of the appeal or petition or a caveat. The same shall be numbered and registered in the appropriate register maintained and this we have by the uh, and its number shall be entered therein. So that's the numbering and the calling the records on admission of appeal or petition if so directed. The terminal call for records relating to the proceedings from any adjudicating authority and retransfer the same. That's in case required. The, the powers that the terminal benches has to call for the file from other benches, that power is under Rule 30. Production of authorization, Ankit can take up production of authorization for and on behalf of an association. So this is restricted to association, Ankit. Yes, please. So uh, here we're talking about where an appeal or application or petition or other proceeding uh, pur purported to be uh, instituted by or on behalf of an association, the person or persons who sign or verify uh, or verifies the same shall be produ shall produce along with such application for verification by the registry a true copy of the resolution of the association, empowering such person to do so, provided that registrar may at any time call upon the party to produce such further materials as he deem fit as he deems fit for satisfying himself about the due authorization, provided further that if uh, uh, it shall be set out, it shall, it shall set out the list of members for whose benefit the proceedings are instituted. So yeah. that's the representation that one can do. Interlocutory application. So every interlocutory application for stay, direction, condemnation of delay, exemption from production of copy of order appealed against or extension of time prayed for in, in pending matters shall be in prescribed form and the requirement state uh, uh, requirements prescribed in the in, in that behalf shall be complied with the applicant besides filing an affidavit supporting the application so these are formats or there are yeah. prescribed formats for these applications also now we have prescribed formats for the uh, orders that need to be uh, filed along with the uh, application that we file. So now we <clears throat> move on to 
regulation as a rule 33 and this is only uh, regarding the procedure on production of defaced torn or damaged documents so whenever any document which is defaced torn or and damaged it will be if it is produced before the registry if it is produced before the registry and it is also mentioned in this uh, index uh, then the same shall be verified and initialed by the officer authorized to receive the same so the officer will mention that it was received by us defaced or torn. So therefore, in future, there should not be any complication. So whenever any document is like this, it will be immediately seen that this is the uh, mutilated or defaced. Now is the general procedure. 34 rule general procedure is like, uh, like let's see what is the general procedure. The general procedure is like there are various forms. NCLT 1, NCLT 2, NCLT 3, but then our, the procedure is starting from NCLT 4 form because the general heading, the general heading in all proceedings that has that is prescribed in form number NCLT 4, even in the advertisements, even in the notices, it has to be general heading for proceedings that we have seen. This is before the national company law. This is the this is something which is in all uh, submissions. In all submission, this must be mentioned before the National Company of Tribunal in the matter of in the matter of so and so, in the matter of give the name of the company. So the first we gave the before uh, before the NCLT, then we said the matter of the company that, and then the name of the company. Uh, so this this is the form that we use every time. Of course, we have made it our own uh, uh, in, in our own computer. We have made a digital copy of it. But otherwise, originally this was a form. As I said, every every petition shall be filed in form, uh, and it is it's to be filed in form number NCLT one, and every petition or application uh, see, shall be verified by an affidavit. So, firstly, we have seen form four, which talks about the general heading. Then we spoke about the uh, form NCLT one, uh, which is uh, which is for the uh, from one accompanied by such documents, and I see this is the yes. So in case we see this NCLT form one, the columns required for filing of original application. So all these are headings, and our, our heading, whatever we have seen in and for and NCLT four, it is mentioned here that heading as per NCLT 4. And then it says that how these petitions will be prepared. And the first part of the petition is the date of the original application, application reply, rejoinder. This is always required. See, see who filed first and then uh, who first fi filed second or who filed first. So this is the flow of the petitions or applications. And then the detail of the original application in case it is there and then the jurisdiction and after the jurisdiction, there'll be a complete limitation and facts of the case as given above, and then the relief sort. If we start from the background, at the background, at the relief sort, facts, the maximum, the, the major part goes into facts of the case, major part. And then some part will go to legal uh, uh, pronouncements. So this is what the, uh, this, is, this is what we have seen that the general procedure and these are the forms and the, even this form is also there how to authorize this uh, by way of sign. So this notice 34, the rule 34 itself continues with the general uh, procedure and then there are NCLT2 for NCLT2 and this is required for giving a notice of admission. Uh, then we have NCLT6 after the heading and all that, this is the form of the affidavit which is required to be given along with any application. Okay, now this is rule five. Rule five is first of all, the heading has to be used. And the after the heading, after the heading, this is required with the names and the designation and let all parties concerned attending the, uh, at, attend. we see this is basically notice of the, notice of the bench. The bench will submit every year notices like this. Okay, advertisement and detailing. Ankit, would you be able to read it? Yeah. 
so uh, in case of any he... advertisement in case of any advertisement is given that will be given in nclt 3a however the language vernacular language and the I mean, this is we can even say in simple words also uh, so instead of uh, uh, reading the entire text yeah so simple the, so simply yeah. talking about this so uh, the the idea is that any advertisement would be uh, it would be in form 3 nclt 3a and it has to be done before uh, and in not less than 14 days before the date fixed for hearing so that's a 14 day advance and then it has to be one in in one one vernacular newspaper uh, in principal and uh, of course at the registered office of the company mm. and at least one english newspaper so very yeah. similar to what ibb also prescribes but the timing is important 14 days before the date fixed for hearing so this is that advertisement detailing the petition this is the form 3a so every such advertisement shall state the date on which the application petition or uh, reference was presented a name address of the applicant petitioner authorized representative nature and substance of application petition and reference date fixed for hearing statement to effect that any person whose interest is likely to be affected by the proposed petition or who one so all that then can be mentioned that uh, it should reach to him yes so where the advertisement yes. is being given by the company then same may also be placed on the website of the company if it ever shall be filed to the tribunal not less than 3 days before the date fixed for hearing um uh, then if it ever shall be accompanied with such proof of advertisement requirements of this rule or the direction of the tribunal as uh, regards the advertisement and service of petition are not complied with the tribunal may either dismiss the petition or give such further directions and most of believe maybe the tribunal will give some more time or understand the difficulties yeah regarding advertisement yeah yeah and this is regarding notice to the other party which is to be given in nclt 5 yeah and uh, this is also like it has to be along with an affidavit and along with the copies of such documents and advance copy is also required and then we have the service of notices and the processes like the as now we have seen that they are asking email addresses also so this is also provided the notice can be served with hand delivery it can be served by registered post or a speed post and service by the even party himself that is also uh, a possible the service of notice by himself by hand delivery that also uh, shall file the with the registrar acknowledgement so whatever way the notice has been served the acknowledgement has to be filed and an affidavit confirming the process of service has to be filed the the proof of delivery along with the proof of delivery so service of notices in any other manner including any manner of substitute service that also can be specified if the person is not reachable then some kind of different different methods can also be suggested and any such method can be erected by nclt for service of the uh, notices so a notice or a process uh, may be served on an addition on, on an authorized representative also and uh, we, we, we there seems to be a, then it's a proper service that will be considered proper service so in case of any substituted service which the tribunal directs the the applicant or or the respondent uh, they will file they they will fix they will pay, they they will pay the charges of the such notices to be sent by the and the lt bench so filing of the reply also the same this one and may file his reply and whenever anyone files a reply it is something which is subject to the subject to the permission granted by nclt so the it should be also served on the applicant before it is filed so these are the uh, uh, very very simple process uh, that we can see uh, filing of the rejoinder also where the respondent states that the additional facts so that this is also Uh, this is also not possible to file rejoinders unless it is permitted so the law is very clear that the bench has to permit filing of the rejoinders otherwise the bench can always say uh, the that the it is not required the, so yeah. the powers of the bench to call for further information that is also there they, they can satisfy them themselves then in case they require any information they can call for the information from any party they can call for the information any party and further info, like this is all the in continuation that the uh, where any party preferring or contesting a petition of oppression and mismanagement raises the issue of uh, forgery or fabrication of any statutory record it shall be at liberty to move an appropriate application 
for forensic examination and the bench hearing uh, the matter may for reasons to be recorded either allow the application and send the disputed records for opinion of central forensic lab at the cost of the parties alleging fabrication of record this is important mm -hmm. i think the in the case of ind bharat ind bharat power infra limited versus india infrastructure finance company limited it it was hyderabad bench it is september 22 september 22 in in case it is it is said the question of law was whether the petitioner is entitled to invoke the power of adjudicating authority under section 40 under rule 43 of the ncd rules to call upon the respondent financial creditor to produce the original corporate guarantee deed executed but allegedly not submitted tendered furnished to be to the financial creditor for verification of the tribunal so whether any document can be called in original this is the kind of powers mm. that we are trying to say that whether it is required whether that can be in fact uh, called by the uh, or not now the background is that there were some corporate guarantee and the corporate guarantee was not submitted and later on the it was required that the corporate guarantee should be submitted and with the original now the nclt in nclt in, in such cases says that the section 7 it is a financial creditor to place the necessary records number 1 now in case uh, the document to be a primary or secondary is not placed before the tribunal the consequences if any or such non production may at least call for consideration or invocation of the powers of this adjudicating authority does not arise it is clear from rule 43 of the uh, ncrt rules that for the purpose of satisfying itself as to the truth of the allegations made in the petition or application before passing the order the adjudicating authority require the parties to produce such further document or other evidences as it may consider necessary the, the the adjudicating authority may pass a direction to produce the document as such a direction to produce a document at the behest of the opposite party is neither contemplated not to be given at the behest of the party under the rule so the the bench has the power but then the other party has no right to say that you please use your power and ask this document for us but in case the bench feels that document and that to original document is important then that can be done that can be invoked and the uh, the nclt can ask for it but the other party cannot ask for it so in, there is there is no merit it was held that there is no merit however with an observation that if before passing the order first of all the nclt decided that there is no Uh, power with the other party, but however, uh, the conclusion that the original corporate guarantee is essential, original corporate guarantee. Says, so the bench, in fact, directed them to produce the original, but they are then they said the then the other party cannot ask us to do this. So hearing of the petitions, and we can actually see. I mean, this is all continuation. So we we can finish it here, Ankit, and we have finished it at. Uh, we have finished it at uh, like. 88 slide number so we can finish Sorry, it take, and... so let's let's just answer a few questions very quickly yes. before we wind up so this one is from uh, pankaj m sethi he says whether advert advertisement advertisement is mandatorily required to be uploaded on company website query since the word used is may so the may word is used because the website may not be there so yes. if the website is there then it is required to be uploaded but if the company does not maintain an active website then it is uh, not required that's the right. idea right you are right you then are. Uh, ravi uh, sita raman is asking can nclt review or recall its own decision what's the difference between review and recall so uh, no the nclt doesn't have power to review its own decisions however we have found that if there are errors then somebody has to point out the error and then those errors can be corrected but review means like changing the altogether decision that power is not there but then the errors if there are that can be rectified by the tribunal then next one is from um, anand chura ji he says can a writ be filed in a jurisdictional high court against the caveat filed in nclt because many state high court rules allow the writ against caveat so uh, writ against caveat not sure what would be the purpose of filing a writ against a caveat form caveat is not something which can be uh, it is not subject to appeal yeah no. i don't think there is any merit in so in like the objective of filing a writ against a caveat is we're not aware of that uh, issue 
can a, can can NCLT direct paper publication of notice to parties? Yes, uh, I mean, yes it has been done. Can. Yeah, in case the done. notice is not being served, yeah, the NCLT has been done many times. Yeah. yeah. So rule thirty five of NCLT rules, Anand Churaji rule thirty five of NCLT rules can be read with order five rules twenty of civil procedure code. So I think that's a comment rather than a question. Yeah. Uh, CA can act as an RP only qualified RPs are eligible. So again, not question. So so many. All right. So then we have. Uh, um, so I think that's about it. Not that I'm looking at any other question. Um, so that's about it. I think it. we can we can uh, we can conclude today. Uh, yeah. with thanks to all the participants. I think in the in part three, uh, we will discuss about the powers of review and uh, so one, that yeah, that yeah, will be. Good, I think that good. that will be. Yeah. So part one small question. Final, yeah. yeah. One small question: Can RP authorize one person from his office to sign the I applications other than? The advocate also on his behalf. I don't think that's possible. Like that's, we have not seen that happening. Possible. That's yeah. not possible. We have not seen that happening practically. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Thank you for uh, being with us and uh, looking forward to uh, see you all of again, uh, all of you again next weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.